Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your living presence with us always. Help us to accept whatever you send is coming from your love and to move as gracefully as water from point to point in our journey toward thee. We are your children. Guide us and bless us. Om. Peace. Amen. We've called our segment for today the happy ending. And uh, my friend Aunt Majoti suggested that as a reference to something I've often commented on about the nature of this universe, that despite the fact that many difficult things happen in our lives, if it isn't the happy ending, we know it's not yet the ending, that it's just one more chapter in a long journey. It's an apt title for today because in our last session I finished the course on chakras, reincarnation, and karma that I've been working on for some 20 sessions. And this is actually the last 9 o'clock broadcast I'm going to do for the foreseeable future. Um, it, what has happened now is that um, I am resuming the life work that Swamiji assigned me about 10 years ago that got interrupted appropriately to write Light Bearer and a few other things, and also because of the pandemic. So it was two and a half years ago when the county that I lived in, Santa Clara County, California, really closed down because of the advent of COVID. And when suddenly I couldn't go to the temple here to teach and I couldn't travel, but the Dharma was um, as compelling as ever that my life work is to share what Swamiji taught to, taught to me um, with as many as are willing to receive it. So I had already, I was already set up in my own living room to do webinars. I'd been doing that for a number of years that we just um, upped the ante on it. And so for these last two and a half years, um, for those of you who are local, well, you haven't been in my house, even if you're local, because nobody's been allowed to come in. We just had a gathering here last night, a small kirtan, which I think is the first time in all this time that we've done it. So I just turned the living room of this house, as you can see. It used to be a meeting room and a party center and all kinds of things. I turned it into a recording studio. And that's how we've been using it pretty continuously. And I had a sense uh, in that March of 2019, as many of us did, that this was going to be a short-term emergency. So I started these four day a week, 9 a.m. broadcasts, and with very few exceptions, I've done them every day. Technical issues sometimes. Um, I, I myself got COVID for uh, Fortunately, a very mild case for a number of days. Occasionally, I would take a short journey somewhere. But I, in the beginning of the time, even when I was traveling, because I went to another location to do online programs, um, I still took my equipment and my friend who could do the work for me and broadcast. But now, I, in two days, three days, I leave on the first of three different trips that I'm taking before Christmas that will eventually take me to Europe for six weeks. And it's just not practical anymore. And I have, a, I have very mixed feelings about this because it's really been one of the most enjoyable things I've done to be able to be with some of you live and some of you on a sort of afterwards basis. But the number of people who've told me that we share morning tea uh, 
is, has been very touching to my heart. So I didn't want to stop without talking a little bit more and also giving you, um, just uh, giving you a little warning, if it matters. Um, it was very interesting when I started these broadcasts, as I recall, and now I don't, I don't um, when you talk as much as I do, you have to make a practice of, of blanking your mind out about what you've done. You can't. You just can't be thinking about it. You have to just put it out of your mind. When that was how Swamiji would talk about it. Swamiji actually talked about it in in very important training for the kind of the kind of uh, sharing that we do, which is intuitive in the moment. I'm not. I mean, occasionally, on rare occasions, I've had some notes in my hand, but most of the time, it's just entirely how what it how it feels. In, in the now and just offering what's in the now. But uh, uh, Swamiji, when he was teaching us how to do this, he talked about every time, well, this was a specific comment. In 1970, uh, would have been, let's say, 78, Swamiji uh, went back and forth across the country uh, twice on, uh, the subject was the practice of joy. And he gave like two or three hundred talks on exactly the same topic. And he remarked that he never gave the same talk twice. It was a different moment. It was a different audience. He himself had been through life experiences that made him a different man. And so the same subject would look different from a different angle. And even more profoundly, the people in the room would need. He responded to the questions and the feelings of the people in the room, um, and they were always different with a different need. Um, he said, but one of the ways he would do that, to be able to be completely fresh, was just, he said, he would just blank out of his mind what he said. As soon as he was finished saying it, he would just let it go into the infinite from where it came. So that is, I know, the only way you can do it. Sometimes stories repeat and so on because you're, you're trying to make a point that, and that the point that illustrates it is a, a particular story that you know. And you know you've said it before, but it's the apt story for the moment. Um, Swami contrasted that to sort of getting the articulation exactly down and going through the points like a, sometimes like a professor would. He has his notes. He has a certain material he has to get it across. With the kind of uh, sharing that we do, the information matters, but the information is only relevant if there has been an awakening, if there's been magnetism. Swami would always say, much more than your words, what we have to share is the vibration of Master. And when that vibration of Master is there, then we all wake up a little bit. And it's, it's Swamiji even talks about it more profoundly that it's the presence of the divine within each one that he's actually speaking to. He put it to, he said he, whenever he's speaking, he's speaking to Master. He's speaking to the potential for awakening in every person. And when that potential is uh, activated, then the individual himself or herself simply perceives something that's always been there. And it's that perception on the part of others that is actually the, the fruit of the effort. Someone like myself, I just focus your attention. <laughs> And then I, t I try to tell you in as entertaining and as educational way as I can, you know, what I believe to be true. But the success of it is that something I've said, or Swamiji has said, has um, sufficient magnetism that all of a sudden it matches a vibration within those who are hearing it, and that vibration activates the energy. It, it, it's so interesting because for the month of August, which for those of you who watch in real time know, I took a, a month in retreat. And I used that month to review uh, a, a, a lot of uh, notes that I have from my years with Swami 
that I organized to write Light Bearer, much of which was used in Light Bearer, but I was culling through two particular file drawers because um, it's all on paper for me. I can't see it if it's on, just on digital. Um, to see if there's uh, another book there, which there is. I didn't get to writing. It took me the whole time just to review it. But in reviewing, I, I, I saw over and over again, let me, let me phrase it how I, I really felt it. I realized that my, everything that I, I think about life, everything I understand about life, about the spiritual path, I just learned it from Swamiji. But I didn't memorize it from him. Even though I can say, Swami said, Swami said, Swami said, Swami said, it's more like when I heard it, I recognized it. Or when he said it to me, it went into me. And over time, <clears throat> I came to recognize it. Some of what he said, I knew as soon as he said it, that it was true. But mostly it, it penetrated. I, when we used to take people on pilgrimages to India, which we did for like 20 years, from 1986 to about 2006, yeah, 20 years, that's what it would be. And then Swami was living in India and others were living in India and they took over the project and it was better to do it from there than from here. We, we traveled for 28 days, which was wonderful, long time. But it always came to an end. <laughs> and after the magic of just being away from home and having no responsibilities, of course, as leaders, we had a lot of responsibility, but we made sure that our pilgrims had one responsibility, to put your things back into your suitcase and to push your suitcase out in the hall so we can collect it for travel. That was, that was like all they ever had to do. We had to train them to just realize you don't have to, you don't have to think about travel, you don't have to think about reservations, nothing. You think about God, we'll think about the details. Just put your stuff in your suitcase when we ask you to and push it out into the hall. So there were many reasons why that trip was glorious for us too, even though it was hard work, but it was glorious work. And I, I remember at the end when we would say, you know, now you have to go back, reintegrating into your other life. And I always talked about pilgrimage, which I still feel is deeply true. It would, it would be like taking a little bit of radioactive substance and planting it in your heart. And it could be so small that you don't even know it's there, but it's going to gradually transmute your entire organism your entire consciousness. And that's what all of the spiritual path really is. We have these moments. That's why they say one moment in the company of a saint can be your raft over the ocean of delusion. Beautiful saying. A friend of mine who has two children who are now grown, and she was a devotee of this path, and Swamiji was still living when her children got into their late teens and early 20s. She felt her job as a mother was to put each of her children in front of Swamiji for that one minute. <laughs> and then she was done because she'd gotten them there. And of course, there's a lot required to persuade them to go and sit for that one minute. And when she succeeded, she felt her, her, the job of being a mother was done. And as it happened, in both cases, it took. Both of them became disciples of this path. Another friend of mine also, uh, the child was born into the Ananda community, and eventually in his early 20s, um, he took discipleship. And again, the father said to me, I did what God wanted me to do. You know, I, I, the ch I raised the child, I brought him to the master. Now it's done. And of course, what happens, we're not free at that point but the radioactivity has been planted. And it, you don't have to become a disciple, but of course that's a big moment. Any moment in your life when the veil of delusion breaks, and even for just a moment, we, we look through the, the illusion and we see the reality. It's a radioactive seed being planted in the heart and it never ends, you know, which is, Swamiji planted many of those seeds in me and I feel I, I need to take what he's given me and pass it on. That's why when 
um, life closed down during the pandemic and I couldn't be in person with anyone. I've just devoted myself to the camera and done, you know, multiple uh, broadcasts every single week virtually, except on a few occasions when I've gone into retreat. But I've just said, this is what I do because I, you never know. You just, you, you pass out words, you pass out commitment, you pass out the desire to share, and it's a vibration that just goes out on the ether. Master, there's a picture of Master with his hands upraised. It may have been at the garden party, I believe, when he was sending out into the ether the call to found cooperative communities. And he was chanting Om at that point, planting his words in the ether. Master said, when you chant Om with deep sincerity, and of course, with power, as he did, he said, instantaneously, the vibration goes out through all of creation. Every Sunday at our Sunday service, we end it. Everyone stands up, let us send out to the whole world the blessings we have received today. And you can either do it like, oh yeah, this is just what we do every Sunday. Or you can send out to the whole world the blessings that we have received. And this technology that we have, where it just goes out. I, uh, I, there's a little article that was being written to help with the Instagram account. You know, I don't actually know how any of this works. By the grace of God, I have friends who help me. But in the article, it, it said, Asha's class on the chakras has 100,000 views. And I, I see the internet, the YouTube every once in a while, and that was a big number. I wrote to Ishani, Ishani, what? Where is this? I did a four-part class on the chakras. It was in 2014, actually. And it's fun. It's a four-part class. Class number one has 100,000 views. Class number two <laughs> has about 8,000 views. <laughs> because out of 1,000 who seeks, only one actually falls, but 100,000 people were interested enough, and who knows? My, my YouTube channel is unusual because people tend to, when they click for the first time, I'm told, they stay longer. I have more, I might not have more views, but I have more longevity of views rather than just click, 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 click. All of this is just very entertaining to me, but also very important because it, it, uh, it's amazing to think 100,000 people. The class itself, uh, I did it in this living room, but I, I did it against this wall at a time when we had curtains on the window that's to my left now. And so we pulled the curtains, and I put up two little charts. I had a whiteboard, and I had a little chart of the chakras. And I was all by myself and my friend. And the, the class, I, I believe I'm correct in this. I think that whole setting was, we had a request to do classes in in. On, in the evening for India, but of course that was the morning for us. And uh, God bless him, Sai Ganesh is a wonderful man, but he's a night owl. But he was kind enough to agree to do a class that either aired at 6.30 or 7 a.m. aired here. And so we set the whole thing up. <laughs> he's gonna, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to because I'm cheeky. <laughs> So I would give the class to the camera and to a nodding off psychiatrist because it was so early. We finished the chakras class. I think we started something else. Then daylight savings time hit whichever side it hits. They made us have to start even a half an hour earlier. And it was, there was no way. We just had to stop. So there's a few of those and then they just end. <laughs> Poor Saganesh, it was so noble and kind of him. I have wonderful friends. <laughs> I always say when I'm talking about subconscious, conscious, and superconscious, and the position of the eyes, superconsciousness, your eyes look up to, toward the spiritual eye. They're drawn up. Conscious, you're just straightforward. And subconscious, you fall asleep, right? If you ever watch children fall asleep, and I always say, as a public speaker, I'm in the unusual position of watching adults fall asleep, which most people don't usually get to see. <laughs> I always feel so badly for them. There's a wonderful, touching story about Sri Ramakrishna 
there was a disciple who was deeply devoted to him, but he had to support his family. He had to work very hard to support his family. The only time he could see Ramakrishna was sometimes in the evening. But after a long day's work, he was so tired, and Ramakrishna used to set a little bed for him. And he would come and he would visit his guru, but he had to just lie down and go to sleep. He couldn't stay awake even for the satsangs. And some disciples criticized him. It's, to me, it's so moving. But Ramakrishna always said, no, you know, this is the only time he can come and he needs his rest. Just so, like, we, we just have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what the effect of anything is. That's why it was like 100,000 people have at least been interested enough in the chakras to click that. How many watched, how many learned, but a little speck of radioactivity of the possibility of another reality. In the Gita, it talks about the process of how we learn, and I'm, I'm uh, just synthesizing what it says, but the essence of it is, you know, at first, nobody ever talks to us about these teachings. Then we casually hear it and pay no attention. Then maybe somebody says it and we look twice. And then, but, and then there's a point where when people talk to us about higher realities, we immediately fall asleep. <laughs> we have the karma to have it presented to us, but it's just beyond what we can do, so we just close in. Then we listen, but we immediately forget. And then we listen, and it begins to make sense, and on and on and on. Swami, at the end, one of the last chapters of The New Path, he talks about how he talks about great spiritual families are formed and how the soul's long journey. It's a beautiful paragraph in one of the last chapters. But he's saying that the soul, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but the soul gradually develops the magnetism to, he says, to attract and hold. You see, there are two different things. You can attract the teachings, but if, if it's not, if you're not vibrating sufficiently with it, you'll hear it, but you won't remember. But then after a while, you'll hold on to it. So it doesn't matter to me if someone just even just sees it and just goes right by. They've at least crossed over. You know, I, I, I had autobiography of a yogi for a couple of years, and I did open it, but I was very austere at that time. And all Master's, master's devotion and the miracles, and it just uh, it didn't attract me at all. I just was very Vedantic. I met Swami Kriyananda, and he was a disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. And if he was a, and I was so attracted to Swamiji, and he was a disciple of Master, he said, This is where it comes from. So I had to take that seriously, and I opened autobiography, and I loved it. And I thought, why, why didn't I love this book before? You see, that's, that's just how it works. And so what I'm also saying to all of you is it is such a privilege to, to be in the position where I have all this understanding that Swami gave me, and I get to pass it on, and I, I get to I get to at least try to do for someone else what Swamiji did for me. You know, and this is how, this is how the world has changed. I, every day I get uh, emails from the various politicians. Sometimes I unsubscribe and sometimes I, you know, I'm curious. We need money for this, we need to do that. The, this is on the line and, and you know, in, in that world, they're telling me the truth. I mean, they're telling me their truth. They're telling me what they feel needs to be done, and I respect it. Swamiji said, if you feel drawn to do something, uh, if it's climate change or political candidates or run for office or whatever it might be, you know, change the world in some way that you think is important, he said, if you're going to do it, do it as well as you can. And so when I see people, doing their dharma as well as they can, I profoundly respect them for that. I don't respect them if I feel that their motives are selfish and nefarious, 
that's not respectable, but they're doing what they feel they have to do, and that's how we all get free. This is the world we live in. But real change is change of consciousness. And I, privilege doesn't, to, to feel privileged as I do is, uh, doesn't begin to express it. I don't know how I got into this position, but I thank God every day. There's not a single moment since I met Swamiji that I haven't been completely aware of what an extraordinary opportunity this incarnation has been, and that's why as soon as I couldn't meet people in public, I had to keep finding a way. But now we've reached the end of it. I'm leaving town. I will be around in the United States, in Colorado, Texas, and Boston and New York. And then I'm, I want to say I'm getting on a slow boat to Europe, but I'm not. I'm getting on a fast plane to Rome. <laughs> and then we're going to move around Europe for five weeks, and then home again for Christmas, probably for Easter, for Easter. You know, I'll be here for a while. I'm, this is a moving in and out. Slim chance I would resume these broadcasts, but I suspect that the entire world will have turned at that point, and we'll just be going in another direction. So when I finished last week, it, as it happens, this is a Monday, and the last one was on a Thursday. I wasn't sure that I was going to finish, but it, it, it finished itself. And because I wasn't sure, I didn't make any announcement. This is the last class. I really didn't know. But it was. But I didn't want to end this, what has been for me an extraordinary cycle, the, the freedom to go very deep into things that are very dear to me, like the guidelines for life for the sevakas and the festival of light and Swami's teachings about death and dying. Honestly, I don't even remember much of what I did because of what I said, but those ones stick out to me. Oh, the new dispensation. You know, to just really offer everything that I can remember that Swamiji said to me. I'm so grateful uh, for your enthusiasm, your participation, and really for your presence. Either presence, time is a very odd item, because even if you watch this later, I have learned from experience and learned from Swami that there's a, a timeless link that nonetheless makes this a very personal sharing. So I am in the privileged position of having hundreds and even thousands of friends, many of whom I'll meet as I begin to travel around the world, but all of whom I know on some deep level. And I'm so grateful. I'm grateful again. Privileged, grateful, blessed. These are the only words we have. But I hope you understand what I'm really trying to say. God bless you all.